Welcome to Southside Bible Church. If there's anyone visiting, we are grateful to have you and glad that you're here to, to worship with us. I've been on vacation, so it's, it's good to, to be back and see everybody again. While I was gone, I had the joy of catching COVID, so I'm the safest guy in the church. Come hug me afterwards, but I do have a very much a lingering cough, so if it starts kicking in, ask God to, to shut it down and, and help in that journey. Well, it's, it was a good season. God did um, a lot of uh, deep refining in my own heart and opening things up and giving me clarity and vision and just excited for the days ahead uh, to lock shields and to go forward. I, I'm like Uncle Sam. You know, call me Uncle Ken as I'm looking for a few good men and women and children who want to be led by the Spirit through the Word of God to lift up Jesus Christ to the ends of the earth for the glory of God alone and at any cost. And so I pray that we would uh, join together in this high calling, and that's what we're going to look at this morning. So before we go back to the book of Romans, um, I wanted to just pull out for one more Sunday. Next week, we'll start up again back in Romans 5. But I just wanted to guide our hearts to where God would have them with some of the things that we're facing uh, as, a, as a church, as a, as a nation. Coronavirus shut us down and there's just so many idols and sins that were revealed. I, I don't think I've ever seen the body of Christ grow more based on the things that God was doing in our hearts when he removed a lot of the things that we look to for comfort. And then it appears like Groundhog Day that uh, we're, we're, we're seeing a repeat. And it's going to bring a whole new set of challenges as I think different idols are being revealed as this continues and the things that we continue to face. Be praying as the elders meet this Wednesday to keep talking and seeking God's face for wisdom, how to go through this. And, and then if that wasn't enough, we had the election of 2020. Amen? The election of 2020. And there was a lot at stake in this election. And even, you know, some feel a possible movement towards socialism, a mounting persecution upon the church of God. And what it did is it opened up a lot of hearts again, and chief hopes and desires and confidences in the United States of America, the land that I love. And what I saw is it brought out fears and anger and anxiety and quarreling like, like I've never seen before. And it hasn't been pretty. And it's as if God is pulling back the curtain again to what is your true hope? What is your true heart and your trust? And he just keeps doing surgery. He just won't let us get out of this season. I know everybody thinks 2021 is it, it's going to be over, and it, I wouldn't count on that. And so God is just doing a work in us, and it's painful, wearisome, and it can even be depressing. And so what, what do we do in a time like this? That's what I've come to help you with this morning, is we, we need orientation. We, we need truth for how to think about what's going on, and how does God want us to think about all that we're facing in light of his plan and his word. And so to think truly, I, I just see so much wrong thinking in the church of God. I'm hearing that the devil is winning and thwarting God's will and we got to stop him. And I just don't want you to think that way. I want to answer and guide us into the sweet place of God and peace where Jesus said, my peace, I leave you. My peace, I give to you. My prayer for every child of God is I, I just want us to enter into that sweet place of peace, why everything is swirling and spinning around us. We're going to enter into shalom, shalom that God promises for the people of God. And so this morning, we're going to take up Isaiah chapter 6. And I remember when I went to seminary, I got this cassette tape. Back in the days, they had cassette tapes. I don't, some of you don't know what those are, but you could listen to sermons on them. And I heard this sermon on Isaiah chapter 6 by John MacArthur, and it was a life changer, and I, I memorized it. And it's really what set me off to seminary. And when I got back from my first sabbatical, I preached Isaiah 6. So I just wanted to give him credit because 90% of my thinking on this passage is where that sermon guided me. I've, I've memorized the outline. I, I just know it. So I wanted to give credit to where credit's due. And the other thing I would like to do this morning is I want to give you a promise not to be a false prophet. I, I don't want to say to you this morning, peace, peace, when there is no peace. 
I promise to not just say everything's okay like a false prophet. But I'm going to tell you the truth. Because the truth is the only way to get to the right place in a time like this. And so I'm not going to tell you if your hope was in President Trump that when all the votes are counted, he's going to really win. I'm not going to tell you that things will always, they're going to get better eventually. No Pollyanna theology here. But I'm going to tell you the truth and I'm going to give you a great answer in light of this truth of what's going on in our land. And so there, there's a beautiful answer. And I, I want you to buckle your seatbelts. And if you got steel-toed shoes, I, I want you to put them on because I'm going to step all over your toes because I love you. And, and the truth is, is what will set us free. And so we're just going to open it up and we're going to let God speak to us. And so I just want you to prepare your hearts and say, God, speak to me through your word, not what I want to hear but what God's word says. And so let's pray and ask God to meet us here in a powerful, powerful passage. Father, we come before you. And I do, I pray for reorientation. I pray that you would help your people to have the vision that Isaiah had in this chapter and that they would see you high and lifted up, your glory filling the temple. And seraphim singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. God, give us perspective. Let us see the king on the throne. Lord, move in our hearts and help us to think your thoughts about this world and our lives and how we should be functioning in days like this. And so I just pray that you would come meet us in a very special way and that your glory would fill this place as we finish. Amen. Well, Robert read... Isaiah chapter 5, <clears throat> what I would like to do is set the context. The context, it's, it's about 150 years before the Babylonian monarch Nebuchadnezzar came in and he took Judah, Judah just captive in total devastation. There, there were people who were killed. They were taken uh, into captivity. It was just a, a massive destruction that came upon the land. And at this point, everyone is just thinking Judah's riding high. They had grown to become a military power. They were thriving economically, and they just felt they were invincible. And just we're just going to get right at it this morning, very much like America today, for many centuries and decades. And so much of, of this was attributed to their king named Uzziah. Uzziah became king at age 16, and he reigned till he was 68. And, then, and so he reigned 52 years, and he'd been a great king for them. But the pride of victory and expansion took over his heart. And at the end of his life, he grew in pride. And he had a very bad finish to a great life. Second Chronicles 26, if you want to read it later, records it. But he went against God's law and he burned incense that only Aaron and his sons were allowed to do. And so he violates God and leprosy breaks out in Uzziah until his death. He's unclean, separated from the people of God. That's a, a sad finish. And it's much like Israel and much like a picture of America. In the midst of this great prosperity, though, this prophet comes along. And this prophet is named Isaiah, and he seems to be off the wall. And he comes and he speaks of a frightening judgment that's going to come upon Judah. And this message that he proclaims, we're going to take up in chapter 5. But just briefly, I want to give you, this is a warning to a nation in spiritual crisis. Though in domestic and military position of power, they're decaying from the inside. The, 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 there's this apparent outward blessing on this nation, but they're, they're, they're about to be judged by God because of the corruption on the inside. And so I want to take a look at the sins that were such a reproach to holy God that he's going to crush the chosen people of God in judgment. These are his people that he loved and he called out. What would bring God to bring judgment upon his chosen people? And that's what we see in Isaiah chapter 5. But one little note as well, that when this judgment came, because they won't repent and the judgment will come, because Judah would not repent, the righteous ones were taken captive as well as the unrighteous ones. And this is an important point for us today. So, so when, when, when Nebuchadnezzar comes upon them, he didn't just say, I'm going I'm to judge the unrighteous ones and crush them. 
He judged the righteous and the unrighteous ones, all suffered together in the collapse of, the, of uh, Israel. And so as America is under judgment, we saw that in Romans 1, that it's not God's going to judge America. He has, and he gives you over to the sins that are characterizing our country. The ones that God has called to himself will experience the pain and destruction that the sin of a nation brings upon itself, except that we will have the favorable presence of God to meet us and help us in the midst of it. So what I want you to see is we're going to lose common graces and we're going to suffer and we're going to have things come upon us as the people of God. I don't want you thinking, no, that won't happen or you're going to get knocked off guard. It will come, but you have the Romans 8, 28, that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love him and call according to his purpose. God's going to be with you. And child of God, he's going to be protecting you and changing you and growing you with this changing environment and the things that we are seeing and facing. You're the safest people on the face of the earth. And so we will all experience the loss of common graces that America has enjoyed because there's no Goshen in America. And so let's take up Isaiah chapter 5. It begins with a parable. Robert read it, so I won't read it again. But man, it's a sad parable. This is about a man who plants a vineyard, and he plants it on a, a fertile hill. And, and so it, it was just the perfect place to plant a vineyard, and it should have borne great fruit. And this guy works the land very hard, and he does everything necessary to have a beautiful harvest. And despite doing everything necessary, something strange happened. And he says, instead of producing good grapes, it only produced worthless ones. And the question from the owner is, what more could I have done? I did everything necessary to have a good fruit. And all that came was sour, rotten berries. And so here's our simple parable. The fertile land was Canaan, the land flowing with milk and honey that God took Israel into. And it says he hedged it in with dietary laws, religious laws, moral law, legal law. He, he set them apart and he isolated them to be different than anyone else in the land. They were to be holy and they weren't to join with the other uh, countries and other people in marriage. <laughs> and then he removed the stones, which is an allusion to the Canaanites. They drove them out. And I put the choicest vine, the Jewish people, this noble nationality, who have made great contribution throughout history to this world. So they had it all. And it produced only sour berries. And I think America is another picture as well. We are God's chosen nation, and we've experienced blessing. I'm sorry, we're not God's chosen nation. <laughs> okay, we're not Israel. But we experienced blessing and abundance from God. And this country started with so many principles from the Word of God. Our Constitution was constructed with such amazing wisdom and insight. And much of our beginnings were built on the New Covenant and to be worshipers of God, and the fruit has been amazing. But what we have watched for 250 years is the exact same thing that happened in Israel. Amidst all of the blessing economically, militarily, and globally, we've imploded from the inside to a state that now wants to preserve wolves more than image bearers of God that we will abort babies. And, and we're a broken land. And we are in Romans 1. And the result is a righteous judgment that will come upon because this holy God of Israel, if he doesn't judge, he's not God. And so a judgment will come upon a nation that's as sick as we are and is given over and as sinful as what goes on in our land on a daily basis. God had every right to expect good grapes. And so he says, Israel, I'm going to lay you waste. Why? Because spiritually they were apostate. The land was filled with moral decadence and they're falling apart. And so my question to you this morning is what sins could wipe out the covenant people of God? What could they do that would bring God's judgment upon them? And I'm going to go through them real quickly in chapter five. So you got woe, it means cursed, uh, condemned, consigned to judgment to be damned. And so this is God's judgment upon a nation, and you're going to be condemned, and you're going, to, you're going to be consigned to judgment. And the reasons were, in verse 8, is you're materialistic. 
I don't, I don't think anything could describe America better than the materialism and the, the, the way we'll cut throats and, and all the, the CEOs and all that goes on in our world and our materialistic hearts. God says, I'm going to judge you because your materialism. The second woe in verse 11 is you're just partiers, alcohol, drugs, pot, the debauchery. You're just a, all, all you care about is the next party and, and just celebrating and being crazy and wild. And that's, everybody's working for the weekend. And you, some of you don't even wait for the weekend. And it's just, this is our country. Partiers. The third woe is defiant sinfulness. I saw a video of a lady having a, an abortion to show the world how beautiful it was and what a worshipful experience it was. That's sick. And the gay and lesbian parades and all that goes on in our land were defiant in our sinfulness against God and we boast of it and we drag it around like courts of iniquity. And then the fourth woe in verse 20 is our moral perversion. He says, you've reversed what is right and wrong and you've substituted dark Darkness for light. The, the, the truth. We can't even decide, you know, if, if you're male or female or who should be married. And we've just reversed everything that God has said. And that's the country we live in. There's been such a reversal of right and wrong. I've never seen it deeper in my days since I've lived in America. The fifth woe in verse 21 is they'll be wise in their own eyes. Be wise in their own eyes. That's, that's our land. And the sixth woe in verse 22 is, is that your leaders are corrupt. The, the valiant men refers to leaders. And so it, you have a nation that the leaders are corrupt. And that's what's going on in Israel. And Isaiah says, I don't care what it looks like on the outside. Go ahead and wave your flags and say, God bless America. But on the inside, you're corrupt. And you stand on the edge of judgment. And so I want, you to, I want you to hear this so clearly. Repentance was the only hope for Judah. There was nothing else that could fix this problem but repentance. Not moral reform. Not legislation. Not politics. And not peace, peace when there is no peace from the church. To love America is to tell it the truth in love. And this is a hard message to swallow with so much outward prosperity, the belief that we're the moral compass of the world. But the rest of the chapter is descriptive of the judgment that God will send. Look at verse 25 or 24. Therefore, as a tongue of fire consumes stubble in chapter 5, and dry grass collapses into the flame, so their root will become like rot in their bosom. Their blossom blow away as dust. For they've rejected the law of the Lord of hosts and despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. The God who's holy has been despised and rejected. And that's the message to our country. Woe is you. You've suppressed the truth of God in unrighteousness and you will not honor him or give him thanks. And judgment's going to come and you're just going to drown in your sin like it's happening all over our land. And it will end in an eschatological judgment that you can't use hyperbole to exaggerate what is coming in the end. So it's not God bless America. But what would it take for God to bless America? And the only answer in this passage is repentance. And that establishes what we're to be about, not politics, about this message. That if you repent, you can be saved. So my question this morning and why I picked this passage is what do we do in the midst of all this? A lot of you are asking the question, how do I think about my life then in this time? Who are we to be? What should we be doing? Uh, what should be our spirit in the midst of it? And I'm going to tell you one thing. It's not to take up social media and start being gnarly and argue, ugly and argue and debate aggressively and throw out theories. It's not to spend all of your time showing liberals their fallacies what should I take my time up with? And I want you to listen to the answer that the Lord will give for us this morning. So here's your outline. Long introduction. Have you missed me? All right. Who said that? Someone said yes. Oh, bless you. Your outline is here are four characteristics of the one that God is looking for in a time of crisis like we find ourselves in right now. 
What kind of men, women, or children is God looking for in the midst of what was going on in Israel and what's going on in America? And we're going to look that you've got to have a true understanding of God, a true understanding of yourself, a true understanding of Christ, and a true understanding of our commission. <clears throat> see if my voice can hold out for two of these. Let's look at a true understanding of God. Look with me in verse 1. In the year of King Uzziah's death, King Uzziah, 52 years, this is big, because to Judah, all their prosperity was tied to this leader. He, he brought the blessings of God upon them. And he dies, and I'm imagining some anxiety and fear is, oh no, we lost Uzziah, 52 years, God's blessing through him. We've never known this as a country. We've had eight years as the longest with a president. And maybe this morning, for some of you, it might be President Trump represented safety to you because he said he was going to make America great again. And you're sitting here going, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Some have tied their hope to America and the common graces that we've enjoyed for much of our life. Some radical changes have been taking place. They didn't start at the election. They've been going on for decades. Anxiety is beginning to, to fill your heart, even some anger and, and fear. And so that could be what Isaiah is dealing with. And so what, what do we do when we feel this way? What do we do? Do you turn on the TV, CNN, Fox, go to social media? What, what do you do? Well, here's your first application. Isaiah goes to the temple. Seek the face of God when things are unraveling around you, economically, presidents, all these things. Quit running to the things that bring anxiety. So watch the news all night and you will go to bed with anxiety. Go to the temple. And something really crazy happened when Isaiah went to the temple. He saw God. And the year that King Uzziah's death, what happened? I saw the Lord sitting on a throne. I go into the temple, and there's the Lord. I saw God. And Isaiah gets a vision. I don't know if he was transported into heaven or a vision. It doesn't tell us. It tells us what he saw. And what he saw was the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted. And that's what we need to see in these days. And in verse 1, the word is Adonai. I saw the Adonai, it's the title for sovereignty, absolute lordship, his strength and his kingliness, the Lord of lords and the King of kings. I go in the temple and I see Adonai. I see the, the sovereign one. I saw what I needed to see. I saw uh, God on his throne. And so I want you to get this. In the year of Uzziah's death, there's no one sitting on the earthly throne. So I go in the temple and I saw the king of kings sitting on his throne in absolute sovereignty. Isn't that beautiful? He didn't get off his throne. The one ruling and reigning is still Adonai sitting on the throne of all. The one that Mary said he's going to sit on the throne of David and his kingdom will have no end. That's the kingdom, guys, that we've been escorted into by the gospel. That's our true home and country. And that kingdom will have no end. And every other kingdom will come to naught. And I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that our true kingdom, king, is still sitting on his throne. And there'll never be a re-election. <laughs> he is going to rule and reign for all of eternity. And whoever takes the throne of America... It says in Proverbs 21, the Lord holds the king's heart and he turns it wherever he wishes. And whoever God puts on that throne, he's going to do his purposes and turn the heart for whatever he wants. Adonai is our hope and our praise. And go into your temple, which I'm going to call the secret place, and see the Lord seated on his throne, lofty and exalted. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. I want to see you. That's all I need. And it says this kind of glory is just filling the whole place. With the train of his robe filling the temple. And, and then the train of a robe for a king was a reflection of the degree of his glory and majesty. And this is a participle 
That's just saying it's just filling the temple. There's no end to it. It just keeps filling. His train is just filling the temple. There's no end to his majesty and glory. It just keeps increasing. And look with me in verse 2. Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two, he covered his face. And with two, he covered his feet. And with two, he flew. The angels have a true holiness about them. They're without sin. These are, these are the holy ones, God's created ones, and they don't have sin. And, and, and this is what they're going to do. It says day and night. They're just hovering over the throne, and they sing this day and night, and they've got to cover their faces because they can't look into such majesty. And they cover their feet like Moses. You're on holy ground. And with two, they flew. And they just are are taken up with God. And I want this to sink in. This is what you need to see this morning. The angels of God that are elect with no sin are covering their faces and their feet in the presence of God. And listen to what they sang back and forth. It says that the Lord, this one is a different term. It's Yahweh, which means the sacred name of God, the four unmentionable letters, God and all of his holiness. And they're looking at him and they're going, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God. And they just keep singing it as they're taken up with it. And this is what's called a trihagion in the Hebrew. And it was a way you couldn't emphasize it any greater. You know, if you, if you said it twice, like Jesus said, amen, amen, it, it's to draw emphasis. But to say it three times, you, there's nothing that you could make it higher or greater. There's no other attribute repeated three times in the Bible. And they're just overwhelmed going, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. They sang it day and night. This is what the church of God needs to see again. This is what our world needs to see. This is what we need to be taken up with in these days. That. The judgment of such a God upon the people that he did all things for them to bear good fruit and all they bore was bad fruit and all the prophets warned them. They were smug and they continued in their sin and boasted in their iniquity. It's right for God to judge those who treat this glorious, beautiful, holy, holy, holy God. It's right for him to judge. And so my first call in this morning is we got to get a right view of God. And I want you to be, I, I can't get over this vision. I've been meditating on it all day in the secret place. What a vision. And the second thing that we need, brothers and sisters, is a true understanding of ourselves. So look with me in verse 5. Then I said, Isaiah, woe is me for I'm ruined. Because I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. (laughs) This is such an amazing part in this context. In chapter 5, Isaiah went off on Israel. Six times, woe is you, woe is you, woe is you. Judgment of God is going to come upon you if you don't repent. Isaiah is a faithful prophet, and he's telling them God's message, and he's calling them. You're going to be consigned to judgment. You're going to be damned. God's going to judge you if you don't repent. Woe is you. Woe is you. And as I've looked out at the sin and all the evil this last year being manifested, don't you feel righteous indignation to denounce it and to point it out? And many of you are doing that. And I hear, woe to the Democrats. Woe to Republicans, woe to homosexuals, sex traffickers, abortionists. Woe is you. And that's a, that's a prophet's job description. It's a John the Baptist ministry. But there's something that we need to, to get as we do that. And I think this is more crucial to our day and age and our response to what's going on around us. Before you start preaching woe to our country, and I'm hearing a lot of people preach it, I want you to get the log out of your own eye and listen to this passage because this is where it starts. Isaiah sees the holiness of God and all of his supremacy and he's taken up with it. And now all he can see is his own unholiness. 
before such a God. As he writes in chapter 64, he said, all my righteousness is like a filthy rag. The most righteous thing about Isaiah was his mouth as a prophet. And the first thing he curses is his mouth. I'm a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips because my eyes have seen the Lord of glory. Woe is me. Judgment upon me in the presence of a God like this. It takes self-righteousness and just kills it. For a God like that, woe is me, I'm ruined. It means to unravel, to come undone at the seams. I'm undone before this God. This is the man or woman or child that God will use. One devastated at his utter sinfulness and unholiness in the light of the presence of God. Not a self-righteous prophet looking down on everyone else and condemning them, that is not the need of the day. Does the sin of our country disgust you more than your own sin before this holy God? Do you need a reality check? Those are the people that God will use. And I want to ask you, have you been undone in the presence of God to truly see your sin and your self-righteousness to just melt away before a holy, holy, holy God like that. And I want you to notice what Isaiah doesn't do in our text. He doesn't look at himself. And, and let me explain what I'm feeling away. Ooh, I can't hear you. I can't see you. It's not so bad. Maybe I can clean up. Maybe I could just go make an offering, be a better guy. But those are the things that he doesn't do. And this is where everyone has to come to. You got to see God for who he is. And you got to see yourself to where there's an infinite chasm and I will never look to my own hands to fix it. My bootstraps are broken. I'm undone. There's no hope for a sinner like me before a God like this. Has he brought you to that place? Well, that's our third view because we need a proper view then of Jesus Christ. Look with me in verse six, and I think these could be the most glorious verses in the Bible. We need verses six through seven, or we're all going to be consigned to judgment. Verse six. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from an altar with tongs, and he touched my mouth with it, and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, and your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is forgiven. This is the but now of Isaiah. There's only one hope for you this morning. This. I've never treasured these coals more in my life. It just takes my breath away. This prophet goes from, Woe is me! in the presence of a God like this, to now he's going to stand in verse 8 and say, here I am, God, send me. That, that's the gospel. That's reconciliation. That's what can happen this morning. So what is going on here is I need more than hot coals to fix my problem. But this, this has got to be more than just some little picture. It's cute. But I, what is this? I need help with what was just described. And so I want you to work through this with me. Listen to Leviticus 16.11. What are these hot coals? Aaron shall offer the bowl of the sin offering, which is for himself, and make atonement for himself and for his household. And he shall slaughter the bowl of the sin offering, which is for himself. And he shall take a fire pan full of coals of fire from upon the altar before the Lord, Yahweh and two handfuls of finely ground sweet incense and bring it inside the veil. And he shall put the incense on the fire before the Lord that the cloud of incense may cover the mercy seat and on the ark of the testimony, lest he die, be consumed by that holiness. Moreover, he shall take some of the blood of the bowl and sprinkle it with his finger on the mercy seat and he'll do it seven times. And so the blood that would be put on the mercy seat would make atonement for sin and would bring forgiveness. What is all this pointing to? Don't stop at coals this morning. 
Isaiah is going to tell us in the rest of this book, what is this picturing? And in the next chapter, I want you to hear one of my favorite verses. Therefore, the Lord himself is going to give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. This coal is I'm going to send a child into the world who's going to be the Holy One, God, and he's going to be born of a virgin. A thousand years before. Isaiah 9, 6, for a child will be born to us, a son will be given, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, and Prince of Peace. And so I would, I want you to see this morning then, as God sent forth his son a thousand years later, and there was an earthquake, and fire came down. In Matthew 27, it says, From the sixth hour while Jesus was on the cross, darkness fell over the whole land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He's basically saying I'm ruined. I'm under judgment. I'm receiving the full wrath of God. He became sin for us. He was under the holiness and justice and wrath of God. He was undone because of the sin of his people. And they were laid upon him. And he became our substitute under the wrath of God. He was undone so that we could be made the righteousness of God. And I want you to catch this. For Jesus, no tongues appeared. No hot coals were applied to him upon that cross. He was shaken by the judgment of God and he was shaken so that we would not have to be. He was pierced through so that we would not have to be. Jesus became the hot coal so that when you are touched with him, your iniquity will be removed as far as the east is from the west and he will remember your sins no more. And you'll stand before this God blameless and holy now reconcile to the God that we just saw who's holy, holy, holy. And you can stand in his presence blameless with great joy because your iniquity, all of it, is removed by that coal of Jesus Christ. In Isaiah 53, verse 5, he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we were healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray, and each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. What God has done in Christ to remedy the problem of perfect holiness with perfect unholiness to dwell together in unity and oneness through Jesus Christ and Christ alone. I think verses six and seven are my favorite verses in the Bible. This is what needs to take up my heart in the midst of these days. Send us out into this broken, unholy world who is seeing but the fringes of God's ways and his judgment against unholiness will increase. The Holy One of God came into the world not to judge it, but to save it. And he holds out the hot coals of his life and his death of atonement to make us one with God. That's why you exist. And this will usher us into then what is our purpose here on earth? Why do I live? Why do I exist? Is it to make America great again? No. <laughs> No. Is it to put tent stakes down and make this, the American dream come true for you? Is that what you're hoping for? Is that what you're looking for this morning? Is it to put our hope in a country whose foundations will be shaken and destroyed? Why do I exist? I need something bigger than America to get me out of this. And I think simply put by Wesley is love so amazing, so divine demands my life, my soul, my all. This is the only way I know how to drive out fear with everything going on in our country. 
is the perfect love of God by the atonement of Christ to bring us back to what's safe and what's real and what is our blessed hope. And I will close out with our fourth point is then you need a true understanding of what is our commission. What then is my life for as a child of God? And in verse 8, Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? What a perfect Trinitarian verse. Who will go for us? And here's Isaiah. Here am I. Send me. And he said, Go and tell this people, keep on listening, but do not perceive. Keep on looking, but do not understand. Render the hearts of this people insensitive, their ears dull and their eyes dim. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts, and return and be healed. You're going to be a a messenger of hardening. You're going to go in, you're going to preach this message, and it's going to harden some. But he says, there's going to be some who are going to be saved. And in verse 11, he asks the right question, how long? What What a hard ministry. And he basically just says, until everything collapses and ends, I have a remnant. I have a tenth of those who are going to call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. And so here's our life. Here's our life. It's to let God bring the surroundings, the events, the trials, the troubles, the faltering country, sin abounding. God brings these things. And I'm reconciled to him. And my life is to help others be reconciled to this God, to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if we have prosperity or ruin, if we're accepted by our society or persecuted by our society, if we have a Republican or a Democrat as our president or our Congress, if we're in a pandemic or not a pandemic, if we're in a false pandemic or a true pandemic, righteous or unrighteous legislation, Steve Green said the mission is still the same, to proclaim and live the truth in Jesus' name. That's our calling. And so I pray, will you join me in not being moved away from this? Our brother Logan preached about a month ago. Paul said, I endure all things for the sake of the elect, that they might be saved. That's your purpose right there. That was Isaiah's purpose. We are, we, we are to go and to give our lives to tell this beautiful message that we have of Jesus Christ and what those coals can do for sinners. And I'll endure anything that comes as I keep proclaiming and telling this message, no matter what persecution or what comes upon me, I'm not moved away from our purpose and why we exist. We're the safest people on the face of the earth. All of our fears and anxieties because the Holy One of Israel is still on his throne, and I want you to hear this, that one loves us because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. What's there to be afraid of? Let it drive it out, and let us, here I am, send me. Right? That's That's our response. So don't seek the American dream, but seek Jacob's dream, where we're ascending and we're having fellowship with God, and we bring others into reconciliation with this God. Amen? I could go on and on. Amen? Shall I keep going? (laughs) I pray. I pray. Let me pray for you guys. Father, I love this bride with all of my heart. And the enemy's swirling, and he's coming, and he's been attacking the bride of Christ all over the world. And God, you're unfolding and you're doing things. You're shaking up a country that just wasn't deepening and growing spiritually in prosperity. And the winds appear to be blowing in a different direction. And I pray that we wouldn't fear it. I pray that we would enter into your will and what you're doing and that you would begin to open eyes and awaken dead hearts that had their hope in prosperity or in a a better America, and that we would be able to give them the hope of a better country whose builder and maker is God and one whose kingdom will have no end and whose king will rule and reign forever and whose king 
is the Holy One of Israel, whose King died on a cross for our iniquities to be removed. God, I pray that our hearts would be taken up with that. We wouldn't be distracted and we wouldn't be moved away from the beauty and the glory of this gospel. God, let us enter in. Here I am. Send me. God, please let that be the cry of every heart here this morning, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.